Uh, this has a different issue though, because these wave objects are inline in memory. When we move them around, we're going to have issues. So we need like a T list of waves, and the wave itself has to all die. Well, let's think. Let's see, if we don't have a wave object, I mean the cool thing about the particles right now is we're it's all inline in memory, it's gonna be fast. Um we have to iterate over all of them regardless, but that's fine, it's gonna be fine. If we have any sort of other T array structure, whenever we erase from the middle of the T array structure, it's gonna be screwed up. Now those TRAs are going to be off in the memory in a little different location though. Am I just thinking this stuff wrong? Yeah, probably. Well, the other thing I could do is the wave ID could write into a bit, and basically what we'd have is the chances of two waves. Um, if if we had a bit field for the wave object stuff, basically for writing, if we have a bit field, two waves would have to be spawned. Two waves would actually cancel out each other's interference. They wouldn't. Uh, what is it? What wouldn't they do? They wouldn't write. It wouldn't interfere with the other wave if it had like a one in thirty-two chance. But it'd have to be thirty-two waves, and those waves would have to be right next to each other for them not to interfere. So I think a packed bit field based on the index might do just what we want without us having to change our data structure. So if we did a uint32 it doesn't matter wave id mod for this thing is what we want That's going to be from 0 to 32 or whatever. 0 to 31. So what we're going to do is inside of our right here. Um, we're going to see if we can write to a specific pixel. So for our particle, we're going to say, what is our bit value? Our bit check value, it's going to be a uint32 bit check is going to be 2 shifted to the part.m wave ID mod. So we'll take the zeroth bit, the first bit, the second bit, the thirty-second bit, all the way over there. So we're basically going to say our bit check is going to be if um, well, it's going to be like this. So if um, what the cells sub data index.
uh, bitwise anded with bit check is greater than zero, then we continue. I guess maybe just and it with bit check. Uh, yeah, I'm using the wrong thing. I'm just gonna write bits. So what's gonna happen is we'll check the bits and we won't write it if another one is in there. Um, we'll have like. A 1 in 32 chance of having the wrong answer and not writing a bit, but uh, I actually need to write these cells of so data index um, dot m write bits or equals with bit check. So we'll set the bit over there when we actually write to it. So it's going to be the first bit that we write. Um, so we're going to be biased towards writing the first bits that we write for a wave, which is going to be biasing towards zero, which is not really what I want to do. I want to bias towards writing like the top of the wave. So if we have a one pixel wide wave, we write the crest. Um, so the question would be, how do we do that? We'd have to change how our update functions. We could just start by writing the crest. So if it's a one pixel wide wave, it's we're just going to write the magnitude in there. If it's a two pixel wide wave, we're going to write zeros on both sides. We need basically a minimum wave size of 5 pixels in order to write everything properly with this algorithm. Uh, so should we have a period value in here that we adjust based on the size? So like if the number of pixels that we're going to write is less than 5 instead of writing between you know this entire chunk of the wave instead of that we would write only this chunk of the wave which instead of 2 pi would just be um, what like just pi but we'd add add a quarter or whatever so, um, So we could shrink the we could shrink the value. If it's two pixels, we just want the front. So I guess yeah, we want to change this calculation right here. So we want like a starting offset and then we want a total length. Well, let's just see what it looks like right now to confirm what I would think happening, which would be we're going to write a whole bunch of nothing until the wave is wavelength is long enough.
So we will need to, I think, have like. I divided by length multiplied by pi over 2. I'm going to have to change this to be like I multiplied by step added to initial offset into this, into the sine function. Let me just do that. So we're going to have float um, step, uh, angle step, and angle offset. So we're going to say int 32 pixels to right um, is going to be math dot fmath uh, max so if pixels to right is greater than five then angle offset equals zero, I guess greater than or equal to five. One, two, three, four, five. Right. Angle offset equals zero, angle step equals what? Two pi divided by pixels to the right. Otherwise, if this is less than 5, so if it's 1 pixel, we're not going to worry about it. This is if we're less than 5. I think we want to add, what, half pi? So like angle offset equals pi times 0.5 up. So that'll take us to one and then we want to just go by pi so it's going to be angle step is just going to be pi divided by pixels to right so if we're going to start at the crest and then we're going to go to the trough and maybe pass the trough a little bit but we're not going to hit the actual trough we're going to kind of skip over it in our pixels which is fine that's that's not the worst thing ever So we should change this to I times angle step plus angle offset for both of these values. So what that should do is that should compress the number of pixels we write in the wave so we bias towards writing the crest as our first value always. So when we deduplicate these pixels, we will always write the maximum value on average. Um, we may write, yeah, because if we reach this location, like we're writing in a circle, we're always going to write our crest first if we have enough space. Otherwise, we might write something, but it should at least be consistent. So as the pixels move outwards, we get something there. Alright, well, we'll take a look at it. We'll see if I'm just full of shit. I just love, I just love how I'm staring at this ASCII this crappy ASCII picture of a wave, and it's like, yeah, this this is a useful diagram. <laughs> yeah, see, that's what I'm talking about. You can see the wave instead of the noise that we had earlier. And we have multiple waves, we have lots of noise. And we just have one wave We've got an actual wave. What a goddamn concept. And it's consistently writing it. That's that's cool. I like that.
The hell was all that flickering crap? See if we can get that to happen again. Now we're seeing some incomplete waves, um, so what I should be doing is, well that's okay, like, I just need to up the number of particles that we can actually spawn. So let's see how what we can actually get away with, because we have actually halfway decently efficient code. It's not, it doesn't look efficient in here because it, it's kind of blown up, but the compiler should be able to deal with that pretty damn well because all the memory is like in line as well like let's just see if we can deal with 20,000 particles so it's like you know all of this stuff is gonna be you know right next to the CPU in the, in cache so it should be super damn fast and really the only thing are gonna be our branch statements screwing stuff up but it should be able to just iterate over all this bullshit crunch through it real quick so I think our instructions are going to be halfway decent really efficient so the next thing is just to add the the reflection off the shore which I'm going to have to figure that out because we need to change the direction we need to do a reflection off of the normal to the shore line with our particle Looks like I'm gonna totally get away with this. I'm not seeing any hit to our performance, like pretty much at all. Uh, the only hit to our performance I'm seeing is when the max particles are reached, so we're printing to the log that we've reached the max particles, which logging to a console window is extremely slow. So that'd be pretty awesome if we actually could just have tons of this garbage going on. I mean basically what I would imagine for this it'd be like if we had some super awesome cave collapse scene or something and like a whole bunch of rocks and shit are falling into the water like we can just dynamically spawn rocks and have all this cool stuff be happening and it'll just dynamically work all over the place. Or you can like, you know, skip skip rocks into the water and have it also work. That'd be pretty funny. Uh, just like tell Adam, I was like, you have to make a, a stone skipping animation for Bitey. I'm going to have him chuck rocks into the background. He'd probably absolutely love that.
Yeah, there's just tons and tons of waves, so I mean, you'd expect this to be all noisy as hell. That's what's happening. <laughs> yeah, see, this is a this is a cross section in time of a fat sack breaking the sound barrier. They're they're really not that quick. All right, so if we're gonna do reflections off of a wall. Um, let's change our blueprint here so that these waves actually live for quite a while. Let's have a wave last 30 seconds. So this wave goes out. Let's give it more than 200 particles. Let's give it like, um, let's give it 900 particles. So that should be enough for us to start seeing the effects of these waves. Right now they're ignoring the rocks, so they're just going to pass right through them. Alright, so what do we need to do for this? We need the I think also when we Yeah, what I'm gonna do is when we actually encounter a wall with a particle and we switch direction, we're actually gonna increment our wave ID mod by one. the wave will be eligible to interfere with other particles that are actually in the wave. Alright, so I need CX and CY. Alright, so we want to reflect if our new position is going to be bad, but I'm going to check if our current position, if our current position is trash, um, then for some reason I'm just going to delete the particle. So CX and CY are actually checking the head of the wave. I guess this is a, a question that we want. I 
I don't think we want the head of the wave here. I think we want the new position. Okay, so I should change it so that the... Where is you? Yeah. Alright, so what I want to do here is get the position of this particle right here. So we want to grab the position here and see if this position is taken up by the ground. And if this position is taken up by the ground, we don't want to spawn this particle. Just as a matter of course. So the CX, CY size. Shit. You don't have the goddamn size in your doing. That's uh, mmap.m width anyway. I shouldn't be using size. Ooh, that's probably something that needs to change in all those. So I'm going to need the direction. Yeah, I need to move some of this stuff up here. I'm just not going to call get next particle. So we get the X and the Y here. Alright, so we get an X particle direction equals direction and part and world pause equals position. So if this position, CX and CY, is in there, then we just continue. Otherwise, we set all that up there. So we'll never spawn anything inside of trash land. That's guaranteed. Alright, cells are going to be the right size, because we have that. Is there anything else that we're doing? Okay, that's all fine. Okay, so if our CX and CY stuff... Size, it better be the same damn size throughout here, so I don't understand why... We'd have to be calculating stuff out here because of this grid square for world position. It's based on the map size. Well, I can remove the size stuff later, so let's just not worry about it. Okay, so we have if m distances um, distance index equals this. I guess we move to that new position and then we reflect, or do we 
reflect and then move. I think we reflect and then move again. Alright, so the Wave ID mod is going to we're gonna increment it by one and then mod it by thirty-two. And we're also going to need to reflect this thing. So why don't we just say um, part.m direction equals negative part.m direction. And I guess maybe we could do a, um, uh, it's not a for loop with a thing in it. Why don't we just do that? So we just like redo that particle maybe? Though I don't like the idea of having some sort of weird trap in here. So we'd want to do something like this. The entire wave is going to reflect though, not... So we're not going to see the wave hit the shore, we're going to see it... It's going to flip, it's, it's going to flip itself immediately. Let's see if it matters if it flips itself immediately. It may not. It may also be that this is not super precise and it looks kind of shitty anyway, so we'll see. Let's just have it go back the way it came and interfere with itself. Uh, I need to do that. So maybe this will work. Um, it's not going to reflect properly around um, this object, but it's at least going to negate its direction. Let's see if it just looks good enough. Because if, if I have to do a reflection, I have to actually go discover the normal. And I, if I don't have to do it, I don't have to do it. You know, if it looks quote unquote good enough, then it's good enough. Do particles actually reflect with waves, or they just invert their direction?
So I guess we have to use the cached distance data out of this thing. Well, where was the static information that we actually saved? I guess we're not using it. I'd have to crack open the texture to read it, wouldn't I? Well, damn. Because this is going to crash too. Because this data is not being filled out. Is it? And we are referencing our flow field data for moving objects. We are we're doing that inside of a different thing. We need to call like fill data on this thing to do this. Should we read it out of the texture data or should we read it out of something else? I'd like to be able to read it out of the texture data. So what we need to do is Let's put in the distance texture here. Alright, let's see if we can actually read the texture data out of this thing with um, without doing a whole bunch of crazy shenanigans. Let's see. Read texture data C++ Unreal. Let's just see if there's an easy one to um,
Okay, so supposedly what we can do is this distance texture platform data MIPS sub zero and that's an F texture 2D MIP map pointer. We'll do map So if math does not equal null pointer, then we should be able to get the raw data of this thing. And it's basically this raw image data is the bulk data on this thing. So it's going to be map bulk data lock in read only fashion. And then the F color array is, of course, one dimensional to access certain parts of the image added in there. And you can pull off the F color on there. You then want to call unlock on the data. So it would be map bulk data unlock. F texture. What is this thing that it pissed about? All right, and then basically I gotta go through this thing for let's see, it's gonna be m cache distances sub so i equals raw data plus i um, dereferenced like so. Is that gonna do it? Because if we can just snag everything outside of this, then um, we can probably replace the rest of it, and then we won't have to save those four megabyte things. We can just use our texture compression and save a whole bunch of space on disk, and this was something that I was interested to see if I could do regardless. We'll see how fast it is. Looks like they changed all this stuff from pointers to non-pointers. That's that's actually I like that. I don't have to go check a whole bunch of crap then. Well, let's see if this can actually work properly or not. So, setup basic map info is going to need the actual distance texture. So we'll throw that in there and see what it does. Also, I'm starting to get pretty hungry. Which means I'm going to, like, have to go eat food and also I need to go to the store because I'm out of caffeine. I need more poison.
Let's get our distance texture, chuck it in there. Ah, crap. Visual Studio has a thing there with this TRA init function where it just goes straight to hell if you try to walk walk over it when it's initializing a whole bunch of stuff. Whoops. Hello, Johnny Ree. I'm working on ripples right now, dynamic ones. And I'm actually getting pretty close to doing it. I'm working on the shore reflection part. I've got the rest of it working out pretty well, actually. I'm just getting the, the height distance available inside of my blueprint. So this will be the distance texture I need to snag. So reading this data out of this thing, are we actually going to be able to grab it? Raw data is null. Why? Distance texture. Platform data MIPS sub zero. I got the bulk data. How come I can't? How come it's null? Oh, well, that's gonna crash immediately. Alright, so how come this is a null thing? So if if raw data equals null pointer um, just does not equal null pointer, then we can snag this data out of it. Let's do an else warn. Unable to grab static height map data from Well, I'm going to have to figure out why I can't actually access that data, even though, like, it's obviously there. Is there a texture streaming thing or some other issue? Distance data.x. Yeah, we need to change that. It's not the distance data anymore. It's going to be the cached distances that are. And I could try moving this thing in a componentized fashion and do a reflection that way. Might be good enough. Let's 
but I probably need to find the actual normal. Experimental Twitch chat in the game at the moment. Yeah, we did stuff like that when we were at Amazon. Getting like Twitch chat hooked up to in the game and like doing stuff where Twitch chat could affect stuff on servers and everything. Some interesting stuff you can do with that. Or you're working on an experimental game that works with Twitch chat. So you're you're making like Twitch Twitch plays Pokemon sort of thing. Or something where you can actually do do cool things. Interesting. Yeah, that's that's something I like that'd be a really cool like hack day project. It's like make like some simple Twitch chat based game thing. You know, like some web page that gets updated by Twitch chat and then you could write whatever JavaScript in there. Make it do all cool shenanigans. Nothing's happening anymore. Why? Because these things don't exist. All right. I need to set inside of my init. I need to set this to 255 so I don't screw things up. All right. It's not that cool, but it's a thing. Needed a break from the regular schedules. Decided to do something else for a week. Yeah, I know what you mean. I've been working on this goddamn water stuff for like a month, so at some point you're just like, kill me. I think one guy was making like a, a progress quest sort of game for Twitch. I forget who that was. I thought that was kind of a neat idea. It'd be like combine those like avatars that are walking around on the bottom of the screen with like a level up system and get them to like fight each other. You'd have like, oh man, you know, like this hero killed this other hero down there. <laughs> and then we like level up and steal all the shit. That'd be really, <laughs> really hilarious. So we've got these ripples here, and um, we don't have. I'm hitting the button to spawn them. What we don't have are the, um, the reflections on those walls yet, because we don't have any information out of it yet. Alright. I need to have to make an appointment for that. Yeah, we need we need our DHS approved euthanasia for programmers. So the question is, why in the hell is this blank? Like, I don't understand why it would be blank. Did we get a warn log at least? We should have gotten a warn log. We didn't get a warn log. Does that mean we actually got the information out of it? No, we just didn't fucking set it at all. Alright, that's because we didn't hook up the blueprint, because it crashed the last couple times we did it. <laughs> we have to call unlock even if the lock fucking failed?
It's like you better call unlock even if um, even if you didn't actually lock it. You're like what? Why? Well, because people are gonna forget to um, to code it properly. So always call unlock after lock even if you failed to do it. What is that garbage? Uh, the other thing would be if the void pointer. Maybe we are locking, but the static cast or whatever the fuck. Shouldn't static cast not do any checks? Like. Like, I thought static cast just, like, chucks it in there, and, you know, regardless of what it is, it was the other ones, like, dynamic or reinterpret that actually did checks to the types. So I'm not sure why I need to read a little bit more on these accessing. It does the same thing, keeps crashing. Use this code, and what I see to modify it, blah blah. The given solution seems to work fine if the following settings are used for the texture, MIP, gen settings, no normal map, sRGB false, compression settings, TC vector displacement map, this article may be of use. Um, so perhaps there's some issues with the materials? Well, we'll figure that out. 